Hello and welcome to this short clip going through question number four from the 2005 paper. This question is about spectroscopy of nanomolecules and uh, nanomolecules are essentially um, representations of common imagery such as the human form but using individual molecules to show it. So you can see it's quite an interesting one here. This is one's called Nano Ballet Dancer and uh, this technology, although it's slightly sort of just a bit of an amusement, uh, the technology itself is quite um, cutting edge because it leads on to nanotechnology, nanobots and all of the different applications of, of those particular molecules. So in order to uh, understand this question you need to have a little bit of background on spectroscopy or NMR spectroscopy. So if you're a first year chemist uh, this first part may be useful um, in sort of introducing NMR spectroscopy to you if you're a second-year chemist, the chances are you'll have actually um, done some NMR spectroscopy already in the, uh, towards the end of the first year, perhaps, of your um, A-level course. So if we take the nucleus of an atom and give it an imaginary axis, it can also be imagined that the nucleus can potentially spin around this axis. So depending on the... Uh, the identity of the atom from which the nucleus comes it may contain an odd number of total neutrons or protons. So some common examples are hydrogen, carbon-13, fluorine-19 and phosphorus-31. So the importance of um, the nucleus having an odd number of total neutrons or protons called nucleons is that the spin of these nuclei with odd numbers of neutrons is significant compared to that of those who have an um, even number of nucleons. So therefore, we can make use of this because basically the spin responds to a magnet or a magnetic field. So if you apply a magnetic field, and in addition we apply radio frequency radiation through the sample, what will happen is the nuclei will flip between two spin states. So what happens is the strength of the magnetic field is varied and the difference in energy between uh, the upper and the lower energy levels or what we call the ground state and excited state of the nucleus is specific to each individual environment. So, for example, a hydrogen might be in a CH3 environment, or it might be in an OH environment, or it might be in a, a CHO environment. So, the environment in which the hydrogen atom, or the carbon atom, or the fluorine atom finds itself within the molecule will affect the difference in energy, the delta E value in the diagram, between the ground and the excited state. So, here's another way of thinking about it. We've got a nucleus with an axis and they're all aligned in different um, directions, you apply a magnetic field and put the energy through it, the radio frequency energy, represented by the blue arrow. And some of the nuclei will align with the magnetic field, some nuclei will align against the magnetic field. So one H nucleus, for example, can either align with the field or against the field. Two hydrogen nuclei can actually align with or against the field in three different ways, as you can see in the second picture. And three hydrogen nuclei can arrange in four separate ways. So, what this means is we get different types of peaks. So this leads to something called the n plus 1 rule. So the basis of the n plus 1 rule is the number of hydrogens in the adjacent environment. So, for example, if we have one hydrogen in the adjacent environment, what will happen is the peak will be split into two. If we have two hydrogens in the adjacent environment, the peak will be split into three. And I think you're probably starting to get the picture. 
So the idea is that the number on the left is your n, and the number on the right is n plus 1. So now what we need to do is take a little bit of this theory and apply it to the question. So before we get started on the question, um, it's worth pointing out that only hydrogen NMR peaks, um, actually split as we talked about a couple of seconds ago, carbon NMR peaks don't. So essentially what a, an NMR spectrum gives us is the environments in which um, atoms of that particular element are found. So before we kick off with the question, let's take a very simple organic molecule. I can quickly illustrate to you what I mean by environments. So ethanol has two carbon environments. Why is this? So the blue highlighted carbon is part of a CH2, which is attached to a CH3 on one side and an OH group on the other. The red highlighted carbon is next to a CH2 group, which is itself attached to an OH, so the two environments are slightly different from each other. So I've highlighted the three hydrogen environments, and hopefully you can see what I mean by looking at the word description. There's a blue hydrogen environment, there's three of them, uh, three, sorry, three hydrogens in that particular environment. There's a red hydrogen environment, where there's two hydrogens present, and there's a yellow hydrogen environment where there's one hydrogen present. So how would this come up in a natural spectrum? So you may find it useful to have your data sheet with you at this point. So if you look at the three different environments and remember what we talked about earlier about splitting, a triplet, in other words a peak split into three, must have come from the presence of two hydrogens on the next environment. So therefore the hydrogens on the CH3 have two hydrogens on the environment that is adjacent. That causes the split into three, because two hydrogens plus one equals three. Now next to the carbon with two hydrogens attached, you have a carbon with three hydrogens attached. So therefore this peak is split into four, so it's a quartet. And you may also notice that there's less area under this peak because there's only two hydrogens in CH2 compared to three hydrogens in CH3. So here, there isn't a, a carbon attached to this hydrogen that has any H's attached to it. It's just attached to an oxygen. So therefore, because there's no carbons that have hydrogens attached to them, that means zero plus one means one. So the peak is not split. It means it's a singlet. That's what we call it. So let's now start with part A. It says, which carbon atoms making up the benzene rings are equivalent? So now we need to just identify the benzene rings. So what do they mean by equivalent? They mean that they're the same environment. So let's look at the, uh, the unmarked version at the top. So you can see that the two highlighted in blue are exactly the same because that's where the arms of the form come off. So you can say that A is equivalent to B, C is equivalent to D. If we move down to the lower benzene ring, E equivalent to F and G equivalent to H. So for part B, what they want us to consider is the carbon-carbon triple bonds. So if I get rid of the highlighting on the main number structure and re-highlight the carbon-carbon triple bonds, we can start again and have a look. So if we start from the top of the molecule, where the head is, and work our way down, You've got I and J, K and L, M and N, and O and P as the equivalent carbon-carbon triple bond carbons here. So because each carbon is in a unique environment, all of the pairs have two signals, 
So there's eight signals in total in the NMR for um, part A, for the benzene rings, but for the carbon-carbon triple bonds, each pairing gives one signal in exactly the same place. So here what you'd get is four signals in total. So now let's move on to the third part. So for this part, they want us to uh, work out how many CH3 groups there are. So, CH3 groups tend to be N groups or single carbon branches. So what I've done is I've identified in red all of the CH3 groups. So now what we need to think about is which ones are equivalent to each other. So if you take the feet to be, or the toes even, should I say, to be one environment, uh, the fingers of the hands to be another, and each of the CH3s that point out of the head, one pointing towards us in green, one pointing away from us in grey, that means there's four different methyl group environments in total. So the next one wants us to work out how many different carbon environments are there in total in Nano Ballet Dancer. So how many signals will be seen in total in the carbon NMR spectrum. So unfortunately here it's not simply a case of adding up all the different signals that we have. Um, it's a little bit more complex than that. So I'm going to ask you to just bear with me and we're going to go through each of the environments in turn, starting from the toes. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. So the fifteenth one is obviously going to be the wrists. Number sixteen is going to be the fingers. Number 17 is where the neck attaches to the torso. Environment number 18 is where the neck attaches to the head. Number 19 is near the top of the head. Number 20. Number 21. Number 22. And finally, Number 23, where we missed out the knees. So this would give 23 separate environments and therefore 23 separate signals on the carbon NMR spectrum for nanoputians, the molecule that we're talking about. So in these final two parts of the question, um, it's switching over from carbon NMR to hydrogen NMR. So... The N plus 1 rule actually follows what we call Pascal's triangle. So much of what's actually explained in the right-hand part of the screen now was covered a little bit earlier in the first few minutes of the, of the clip. So it asks you, into how many peaks will a signal from a hydrogen that couples with five other, other hydrogens be split? And what ratio will the peaks be? So if you have, so therefore that means if n equals 5, n plus 1 equals 6. And if you take the pattern from four hydrogens, you can see that it would follow that five hydrogens would have 1 to 5 to 10 to 10 to 5 to 1. Now the next part says on the table in your answer sheet. Now, we don't have an answer sheet because we're working from a clip, so what we're going to do is assign the hydrogen environments 
A, B, C, D, E, and so on and so forth, like they are in the spectrum. So, because we're running out of room, and we need all of this information that's on the screen to help us, plus we need the data sheet, it's going to look start, start looking quite crowded if I cram it all in. So I'm actually going to leave it for now. Uh, I'm going to leave this part of the question, question F. So, why don't you grab your data sheet yourself and give this part a go? It'll be good practice for you. So in the meantime, thanks for listening, and until next time, see you soon.